Thank you very much, everybody, for coming back. So in our specialty, we, we have three distinct groups that we thought we, we would require mentoring and their needs are slightly different, although we're all in the same specialty. So trainees, we thought would have their own needs, uh, junior consultants or consultants in the first three, five years, uh, they would have their own needs for mentoring. And then the, the, the more difficult group would be consultants who would run into difficulty um, on how to support them and mentor them uh, back into uh, normal practice. So my talk is, is going to practically just focus on trainees in general, but I will mention some general points as well uh, without trying to repeat much of what Lucy has, has, has gone into. So basically mentoring activity of giving a younger or less experienced person help and advice over a period of time. So it's help, advice over a period of time. That's what mentoring to me means. The GMC, the BMA, Royal College of Surgeons all advocate that we should have uh, a mentorship scheme uh, as part of any organization. And our society has the, the moral and professional responsibility to provide mentorship to its members uh, whenever it's required. Uh, and therefore it has taken on uh, this role and I hope it will continue to be supported by SCTS. The era of shorted training with publishing results has affected everybody, has affected junior consultants, have, has affected even senior consultants, and obviously is affecting junior trainees. Uh, the GMC had published this document in 2015 of leadership uh, and management for all doctors as part of its ethical guidance. And it basically states that all doctors should be willing to take part in a mentorship scheme uh, offered by your employer. And doctors with extra responsibilities should be willing to take on a mentoring role for more junior doctors and other health professions. So the GMC does expect us to take a mentoring role for junior uh, colleagues. And that if we have to, if we agreed to act as mentors, we should be competent in the role and we should be trained in the role. And this is why we've developed this course, uh, a bespoke course for cardiothoracic surgery. There are other courses available as Lucy mentioned in trusts uh, uh, and there is asset course, uh, which has been running for a number of years. Uh, that's the association of, of trainees. Uh, I, I, in, but we wanted to develop our own training course and that's why uh, hopefully going on from this, uh, we will develop the mentorship scheme and people who have been trained have gone through this and are willing to become mentors will, will be used in the future as, as mentors. Uh, and we, as mentors, we should be clear on what we are aiming to, uh, to achieve with the mentoring of our trainees. Uh, and we, we should be all aware of what are the opportunities for us to be involved in mentoring in, in our uh, trust and in our organizations. This document, which unfortunately is not going to project very well because um, it's not uh, in uh, this, it's not in project in display mode. Anyway, this document came out of the Royal College of Surgeons uh, in November of last year and it was issued by the Professional and Clinical Standards. And it does have its own definition of mentoring, which is very similar to what Lucy had said uh, and what I had said earlier, which is an experienced, highly regarded, empathetic person, the mentor guides another individual, the mentee, in the development and re-examination of their own ideas, learning, and personal and professional development. So it, it, this is not a clinical or educational supervision. Although a lot of us are involved in clinical and educational supervision. This is not, mentorship is not educational or clinical supervision. It is not counseling. It is not patronage or giving advice. It is to allow trainees to achieve their potential through exploring their aims and objectives and facilitating that discussion and facilitating them to achieve their objectives. Uh, and it is not an apprenticeship model or, or surgical skills training. That's not what mentorship is meant 
to be. And the key principles and the, uh, that are stated in the College of Surgeons uh, document, which Lucy has touched on most of them, uh, the relationship between the mentor and the mentee should be a free relationship entered into without co coercion. So nobody should be pushed into mentorship. Although sometimes you, you may suggest somebody, you might need to find a mentor, but if they're not convinced that they do need a mentor and the, they go into that relationship uh, with an open mind, then it's not going to work. Uh, the, any discussions between the mentor and the mentee, as uh, uh, Lucy said, should be confidential. However, there are obviously exceptions to that, where if it's patient safety uh, at issue or a duty of candor issue, that will supersede that and, and then you have to act differently. Uh, we have to agree the, the, the boundaries of the mentorship from the beginning. So what do you want to achieve from this? Where do you want to go with this? Uh, and it has, we have to be able to put some effort and time into this. Uh, we cannot do it five minutes in a corridor or 10 minutes here or 10 minutes there. We need to be able to build it into our working schedule and give it the time it requires. Because at, to be able to be successful at mentoring, it's a long-term relationship. You need to be gaining trust. You need to be regularly talking to this person, the mentee, to try and help them achieve their potential. And as Lucy said, it, it is up to the mentee to set the agenda. It's not my agenda. I don't come to these meetings and lecture the mentee on what they should be doing and what they should be saying and how they behave, but it is their agenda. And I'm just there to facilitate the thinking, to, to their reflection, to help them uh, develop. But what's in it for me as a mentor? Uh, I'm putting in all this effort and all this, but Lucy also mentioned that as a mentor, you get the opportunity to reflect on your own attitudes, ideas, uh, and listening to the, tr the trainees um, can, as, as reverse mentors uh, can give you an idea and understanding of what are the problems they're having and how you can help these in general, but also it might allow you to uh, act differently in the future when you're dealing with trainees yourself. But also, we, you know, altruistically, we, we should be all be in a position that we have gone through all these steps and we're consultants now or seniors that we should be able to uh, help our more junior colleagues and support them in their own development um, and uh, progression. Lucy also mentioned some of these. Uh, how to be a good mentor and she gave us fantastic uh, techniques of discussing uh, the, the problems during uh, a mentor, mentor mentee meeting as well as how to set the goals and how to go about them. Um, but there are the personalities that come into this relationship and we're all different. Uh, we all come from different backgrounds. We've all had different uh, paths to where we are now and we all bring that into into the meetings but we need to be wary of that and it is as I said before it's not our agenda it's what the trainee wants to get out of this but we have to be approachable we have to be interested in what they're saying we have to listen to them be open-minded not judgmental uh, actively listen to them uh, and constructively questioning and, and Lucy had, meant, had given us some ways of questioning that are less uh, uh, confrontational that we should be uh, utilizing in these meetings. So to just look specifically at trainees, I, I thought there are three groups of trainees that we, we have, and I thought that their problems might be slightly different. And if you're mentoring these different level trainees, you might be thinking, about them differently. So for the run through guys at ST1 and ST2, they've just finished the foundation school, uh, foundation training, and they've just moved into their specialty. They still have the foundation mentality. Uh, they're still not 
maybe as independent or mature as you would like them to be, uh, as we're used to having trainees in our specialty. Um, and, and that could play a major role in, in the way they're behaving and in the way they're developing. And we need to have an understanding of that. Uh, and because of the potential immaturity, I'm, I'm not saying everybody is immature, uh, is into ST1 and ST2 at all, but because of that potential immaturity, they may there might be potential to develop uh, dependence rather than mentoring relationship. And, and I've seen examples of that where the, the, the trainee at every opportunity just rings and phones and emails and, you know, with, with every encounter they have. That is not mentorship. That has become a dependent relationship. And we need to be careful about guarding against that and maybe terminate that mentorship relationship or revisit the aims and objective of that mentorship uh, relationship. They also have, obviously, as we all know, lack of surgical skills, and that might have an impact on their uh, confidence levels that we need to be aware of and, and, and discuss with them and address issues on how they can do that. So uh, if they're having problems getting started, as Lucy was saying in the models that she described, maybe they can think about where they want to be and then think about the different steps they have to go through to get to that level. And then, so you, with your experience, you can give them the roadmap to get to that level. They also, a lot of them have not gone through cardiothoracic surgery in foundation school. And we've seen that in, in many trainees come to ST1, ST2, they haven't even had a, a, a placement in cardiothoracic surgery and have not had a major understanding of, of the specialty, which will have an impact on the way they are behaving and the way that you need to guide them through their first and second year uh, in the specialty. And some of them will develop dissatisfaction with, with their choice and maybe become attracted to other surgical specialties. Uh, because as I said, during foundation school, very few go through cardiothoracic surgery uh, and very few even go through surgical specialties nowadays uh, because the majority of placements in foundation school are medical. So they, they, they might not want to pursue cardiothoracic surgery or surgery at all in general. So that's another issue that you will need to be thinking about and how to address that with them. And just a, a, a question to everybody, and I would like everybody to answer this question in the, in the chat, please. Uh, so if you're having a mentorship meeting with an ST1 trainee after six months in vascular surgery and halfway through the first six months of cardiothoracic surgery, the trainee says he enjoyed vascular surgery a lot and is not so keen on cardiothoracic surgery anymore. So how would you, as a mentor, would you address this situation? Would you A, support the trainee to change specialty? B, persuade the trainee to, pursue, to persist in cardiothoracic surgery? or see none of the above and you have another solution. So can everybody just vote in, in, in the, uh, please, A, B, or C? Excellent, that's good. So, so we do have a, a reasonable spread of A, A, B, and, well, A and C mainly, but uh, there is no, I cannot see any A's. So uh, I'm just going to ask a few people if you don't mind. Uh, Rajesh, uh, Rajesh Shah, you said A. Uh, what is your thinking with that, please? If you don't mind talking to us about why, why would you think A is the right answer? So I think he, he's, uh, the, the trainee has spent some time in, in six months of vascular surgery, has spent some time in, in cardiothoracic surgery. Uh, and, and the trainee is expressing a view, uh, you know, outlining he, he would be more, he or she would be more keen on uh, on vascular surgery. Uh, I mean, clearly during the conversation, one should explore uh, how and and what, you know, with with some uh, some further questions. Uh, and following that, if the view of the trainee is 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 uh, to do vascular surgery, then and then I think it's quite reasonable to encourage uh, in that direction. Uh, after some conversation during a, a discussion. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Simon, uh, <laughs> let me ask you, you, you chose C, Simon. Yeah, I, th I thought. So what would you do instead, if, you, if you're not going to support them doing vascular, if you're not going to push them into cardiothoracic surgery, what are you going to do? In this it's, um, I, but because of Lucy's talk, it made me think, and she educated me about it all, and it was more about engaging in the conversation where they led the conversation and you listened and, and helped a bit. So um, I thought it was more about, what was the expression? Rather than push, it was to pull. <laughs> Good, okay. Uh, and and uh, uh, Haider, uh, if I may ask you, Haider Mohammed, can I, can I ask you why you, did you choose B? Well, as long as I'm doing cardiothoracic, uh, so if they have been there, uh, maybe they did enjoy it, but I would try to have a different approach, trying to convince them. So you, you think they, they will try to persuade them to continue? Yeah. Okay. So so there is a, there is a wide, you know, there is a difference here and not everybody's going for the same option. Some have gone for A and some for C, less for B. But, uh, and what we're demonstrating here is that we're bringing our own background into this. Um, early on in my career, I had faced a similar situation, but and, and I actually followed example B, and and I and I now regret doing that, uh, and I know it was the wrong thing to do uh, for the trainee, because I don't think he he is a happy trainee in cardiothoracic surgery, and I think we should allow them to uh, either change specialty whenever they want to, although I know from the figures that not many of our ST ones, ST twos have left uh, the specialty. Um, after being appointed, there's very few of them have left the specialty, but that uh, situation can arise. And I think we need to listen to them, maybe explore it more, allow them to have continued, the, finish their exposure for the six months and revisit the situation and uh, discuss it with them more. But there are situations like that that uh, uh, can arise. If anybody wants to have an opinion on this, please put your hand up in the reaction and, and please come in and, uh, and express your opinion if it, if it is different. And uh, uh, this is the whole point of, of this. It's just to simulate a bit of discussion on how people might react to a situation like this. And we can go back to that if somebody thinks of something later on. Okay, so if, if we, that is the early trainees, but then we have early higher trainees and their, their needs are slightly different. Uh, there is now very important decision that they have to make between cardiac or thoracic surgery. Before they could say, I want to do cardiothoracic surgery and plod along for a number of years as cardiothoracic surgeons and maybe at the end decide they want to go either way. But now they have to make this decision early, especially with the new um, curriculum coming in next year they have to make it by the end of ST3. So that is another major decision that we might have to be guiding them through. Um, they're starting to develop their surgical skills in the presence of reduced training opportunities and the difficult uh, situation with the publishing of results. Although this is the pressure of published results is, is seems to be coming off now um, hopefully with the changes the SCTS is implementing and publishing data and also from what we heard from NICOR about uh, maybe discarding some of these periods that we are uh, going through at the moment. But publishing results had had an impact on the way we train and uh, what we allow trainees to do. And there is... Do you want to share your slides? Oh, sorry. I apologize. apologize. Thank you. At least somebody's awake. Uh, is that it now on, yeah? Perfect, thank you. Um, and uh, the, the, the introduction of uh, disruptive technologies like TAVI has had a, a major impact. So initially it was just the high-risk patients that we don't normally operate on, then they moved on 
to the moderately moderate risk patients, and now they're moving into low risk patients. So, uh, you know, if, the, if there's going to be a reduction in the number of AVRs we're doing, are we going to be able to maintain our own skills, let alone train other uh, juniors on this? So, and they're facing that as they're starting to build up their clinic, their surgical skills. They're also learning their leadership skills on the wards, in clinic, and in theater, leading the team in theater, conducting an operation. That is a major skill that they need to learn. And Lucy had mentioned us, to us some ways of developing that skill. And this, some of them have progressed further if, and they're starting to establish their own surgical independence and maybe do operations by themselves. And that has uh, another field of problems about confidence, about uh, are they doing the right thing, questioning themselves, uh, that we might have to discuss with them and take them through. So another question. Trainee near the end of ST3 likes both cardiac and thoracic surgery and asks you to help them choose. So would you choose A, recommend thoracic surgery because it's easier and easy to get a consultant post? B, would you recommend cardiac surgery because it's more challenging and rewarding? None of the above, what else would you recommend to them? How would you manage this situation? Can you vote again, please? Of course, I'm being flimbered about thoracic surgery being easier. I don't want any of my colleagues to get offended. So the majority of you think C. So uh, how uh, could anybody put their hand up to, to tell us how would they like, how would they manage this situation? How would they guide this trainee through that selection process? Uh, hey, Mahmoud. Yes, please. This is something which we face constantly, isn't it? But you have to drive it through the trainee, find out why they came into the specialty in the first place, what was their interest into the specialty, and look at what they have enjoyed in their time frame till now to see what the strengths and values are. Clearly, their assessment is he a microvascular surgeon, is he a hand eye coordinated, distant vision surgeon, all those things come into the mix as well. Then we have to offer them a balanced view of where their experience skill set will have most option of flourishing, equally well to give a pragmatic and a realistic view of where the specialty is going in the future and let them make the decision. Yeah, it, 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 I, I agree with you totally. It has to be their decision. You, you cannot tell them. And uh, Rajesh, I don't, yeah, I agree with you. That thoracic surgery is different. It's not easier. I should have said that. Uh, it's different. I knew I'll offend somebody, uh, but it's it's okay if it's Rajesh because he's nice and we'll take it. <laughs> we'll take it. So Rajesh, how would you handle a situation like this? Have you come? Raj, he was trying to mean that they'll get a consultant post sooner and quicker in thoracic surgery that, that, as opposed to cardiac surgery. That's what I meant. Yes, <laughs> and and actually, this is a point that has I I have heard it from trainees that uh, oh, thoracic surgery is going to be shorter training. I can get a job quicker. Why should I bother with cardiac surgery? And I don't know if it's going to create a problem with cardiac surgery training, you know, training in general, but it, it is coming in. How, how would you face this situation, Rajesh? Have you come across this situation? Yes, um, Mahmoud, I think Sri has articulated quite well. Uh, uh, you know, it's a conversation really between, between us and the trainee. Uh, you know, exploring what the trainee has enjoyed, uh, what what their skill sets are, what do they wish to, you know, how do they see their future in five years, 10 years time, uh, what the opportunities are uh, uh, and, 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 and allow the trainee to make their mind up uh, and, you know, provide with some, uh, some realistic, uh, uh, you know, views on the future. Uh, you know, they, it's an evolving field, really, isn't it? You know, there are lots of things in 10 years' time are going to be different than what they're, they're, they currently are, uh, you know, with respect to thoracic surgery, minimal invasive, robotic, in cardiac surgery, you know, the TAVIs and the mitoclape and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think uh, it's, a, it's a matter of conversation, but ultimately the trainee needs to make that decision. Absolutely, absolutely agree with you. It is 
the trainee. And your your role in this is just as a mentor to get them to reflect on what they want to do, whether they want to be, what will suit them more, and for them to make that decision at the end of the day. Because uh, if you make the decision for them, it, it is not going to work out well for, for them. So just very briefly now to go to the last group of trainees that we have, uh, which is the higher level of trainees. Uh, their, their main problems at the moment is building on numbers and experience because they've been given the target of 250 cases and they're working very hard at building up that number and they need support, they need ideas, they need uh, in, uh, advice on how to build that number uh, in, in their training time and it's going to be in a shortened training time in the future. Uh, but also they need to be developing other skills, leadership, education, research, um, that will help them in the future. They're thinking about doing their exam or they're going through the exam, they might have failed the exam, how to deal with them about the exam failure, it, it is a major uh, issue for a lot of trainees, although luckily our trainees don't fail uh, the exam that much, but it can happen and uh, you need to be able to take them through that rough period by supporting them and maybe use the techniques that Lucy was talking about of when I pass the exam I'll be able to do this and think of about it in a positive session, uh, positive light rather than turning it into a negative thing. They're thinking about fellowships, you need to be able to signpost fellowships for them, tell them where potential fellowships are, what kind of fellowships they could go for. Um, they can be thinking about subspecialization, which, which way will I go, what will I do. And, and you need to be familiar with how to guide them through all these uh, different and difficult issues. And then they're starting to apply for consultant course and they will be discussing with you about where to apply where to go, where not to go, and all of, all of the issues that involve applying for a consultant. And just in the same vein, we, we have an ST8 who is unsure to, uh, to apply for a local consultant that's just come up or to hold out for a permanent post. What would you suggest to them if they were asking you this in a, in a mentorship session? Would you recommend them to go to the locum post, apply for the locum post, or don't extend your training and wait for a substantive consultant post or something else. C can we vote please? So S Steve Billing, you said A, uh, if I may ask, this is my last slide and I'll be one, one last minute. So uh, Steve, why, why do you say A? Partly because it's what I did. Uh, <laughs> I think if a trainee is ready for a consultant post and ready to work independently, uh, waiting for a substantive job that's not there is, is a second choice to actually becoming a locum consultant, developing an independent practice, especially if you're in a supportive unit. It's a really positive step. Uh, thank you. Moby, you said uh, C, none of the above. What would you advise, Moby? Well, I think it depends upon, the, you, it, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a big question with a big answer because you can't really uh, compartmentalize it. it. Depends upon the trainee, depends upon the post, depends where the locum is, what the trainee wants to do. So what you've got to do is advise them. You've got to talk with them, advise them, you've got to give them the pros and cons, but ultimately it's their decision. You should not push them to one job or the another. We've seen locum jobs that have ended up in disasters. We've, and you know, so, so people have to make up their own decision and own mind. Mm. Uh... Anybody else has an opinion on this? Yeah, I mean, you have to weigh, the, as, as Moby was saying, you have to weigh the balance. There are trainees that have gone into a locum job and it, it worked out fantastic for them and they walked into a substantive post, but there are other trainees locum, went into a locum post and that was a disaster and they never were able to progress beyond that locum post and they may have not got the support they required. Substantive posts now to walk into our very few coming out. The, the most most units are looking for a locum first before they to test them before they would appoint a substantive post. So there are all these difficulties and pros and cons that you will need to explore with the trainee and with their own set of circumstances, with their own also personal life, which will come into this, uh, and to achieve a decision that they will 
uh, come up with and proceed with. Thank you very much for listening to me. That, that is uh, just my exploration of what trainees problems might be and issues that we will face during mentorship uh, of these trainees. Thank you.